Hi, everyone. Welcome back to those of you that are coming back to another session here for our peer support conference. Please jot down these email addresses that are on the screen. That is the Empower Idaho team, and they will be available to answer tech questions and provide support through, throughout the session, again, related to, to tech issues. Um, we'll wait, honestly, just a couple seconds because I know Norma has a lot of really great information to share with us uh, before we'll, we get started, okay? All right, here we go. So my name is Alejandra Del Toro and I am the Education and Community Coordinator with Empower Idaho. Empower Idaho is an organization that offers uh, provider trainings, education and advocacy for adults with behavioral health conditions in the state of Idaho. We are here today with the ever so wonderful Norma Yeager, who will be providing a wonderful presentation on what does trauma have to do with me? Understanding and managing vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue. Quick overview with the control panel. All attendees are muted and your webcam is disabled. So the way that you'll communicate with us is through the questions drop down box. In that box, you will not only ask your questions, but you are also welcome to put in your comments and be as interactive as you'd like. Uh, we will have uh, periods throughout the presentation where we'll review the questions and we'll also have some time reserved at the end for a Q&A. So just know that uh, your questions are welcome at any point. We'll get to them when, when the time arrives. All right, and then also in the control panel, you'll find the handouts drop-down box. In that box, it contains a copy of the slides as well as a handout that Norma has provided for us that she will be referencing. So please do take a moment to download those so you have access to them before we officially get started. All right, this session is being recorded and that recording will be available within the next couple of business days on the Empower Idaho website. And those of you that are seeking CEUs, please refer to the confirmation and reminder emails, which details out all of the criteria that um, you must meet in order for you to be eligible for those uh, continuing education credits. We'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Norma. Thanks for being here with us today. Thank you, Alejandra. I am so excited and pleased to be with you. And for those of you who are peer support specialists and recovery coaches, I just want to tell you how proud I am of you and the work that you do. Um, you are pioneers of this peer support work in Idaho. And I believe it's so very important. I've, I've said many times, and I truly believe that in the behavioral health field, the uh, addition of peer support um, is going to be a game changer in terms of the outcomes and the opportunities for recovery that we provide for people. So um, welcome, I'm, I'm delighted to be with you. So the title, uh, if you wanna switch the slide, uh, Alejandra, the title of this is, what does trauma have to do with me? You know, we've done a lot of education and training about understanding the trauma that most of our participants come to us with. Most of the peers that you work with have histories or ongoing experiences of trauma. But what does trauma have to do with you? What does it have to do with me? Next slide. So when we speak of trauma, um, we are understanding that um, trauma uh, is, is something that is very much a part of the uh, environment and field and work that, that you all, that we are, are, are doing. So as we talk about trauma, um, it can be a trigger. 
um, you need to think about how you're feeling as we go through some of this information. Uh, and if you feel uncomfortable at any point, please feel free to take care of yourself. Get up, uh, take a break, uh, have something to drink, something to eat, take care of yourself. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, so you work in a, a literal, a virtual sea of trauma. Peers universally present either with a history of trauma or a life of ongoing trauma. Their trauma will extend to you and it will impact you. This is what trauma has to do with you. Um, you do not have to be a victim. You can take charge, but you will have to work at it. It will not necessarily uh, come easily or naturally. And as we get busy and as we get caught up in the work that we're doing and all of the demands on our time, it's easy to let um, time move on and to uh, deprioritize the kind of things that are important for you to do to uh, take care of yourself and to continue to manage the risks associated with all of the trauma that you're working with. Next slide. So addressing the impact of this trauma that's all around you, um, it's a personal issue, certainly can impact your personal well-being, but it's also a professional issue and an ethical issue. You know, we spend a lot of time in training, talking about ethical principles that are important in the peer support uh, work that is done. And so a professional issue and an ethical issue to take care of yourselves in relationship to the trauma that you are working with in the peers that you work with. Your physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual wholeness can be damaged and lost. Your professional competence can be compromised. Our contributions to our team or workplace can be jeopardized. And even our ability to meet the professional standards of the work that we do can be impaired if you don't take care of your own needs to address the risks and involvement of trauma in your life. Next slide. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about secondary trauma or vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue. Next slide. So these um, terms refer to secondary trauma, for example, experiencing the signs and the symptoms of those mirroring those of the individuals, the peers that you're working with. Um, individuals who may themselves have directly experienced or observed a traumatic event or circumstance for you when you're working with them show up as hyper arousal, uh, a really strong startle reflex, uh, being jumpy, uh, you know, somebody drops something heavy in another room and you jump, um, heart rate increase, pulse, uh, intrusive thoughts of having thoughts about the issues that someone may have brought up, the stories, the experiencing of their trauma, how that has resonated with perhaps your own background with trauma, because we know that many of us in this work certainly come with our own experience of trauma in our history or, or even currently. Um, avoidance or numbing, um, anxiety or depression. Next slide. So those are experiences of symptoms related to those of the people that we're working with. Vicarious trauma, peer specialists or others doing therapeutic or helping work with trauma survivors may experience certain changes in themselves. Their relationship with life's meaning or hope, feeling like, you know, what, what's it worth? What, am I making any difference? Uh, can anything be done to resolve all these issues that people have? Uh, you know, what's the point? Uh, your willpower. You know, we all have certain things that we may reach for to um, comfort ourselves. Chocolate comes to mind. Uh, in my case, mashed potatoes or beautiful uh, hot rolls come to mind. 
Um, and, you know, we know some of the things that we need to do to take care of ourselves, but the willpower to do that can become undermined uh, as we experience some of the symptoms and risks associated with working with people who have experienced trauma. Your sense of humor may be impacted. Um, we may find ourselves suddenly um, being willing to make fun or to make light of um, you know, other people in our efforts to lighten situations. Our sense of humor may end up with a bit of an edge, with a bit of a cutting uh, element to it. I had a, a coworker once who uh, really was experiencing her own personal trauma as well as, you know, probably some vicarious trauma. And she would say really kind of critical, sarcastic things. And then she would kind of giggle a little and say, oh, I'm just kidding. Well, the reality was she wasn't really kidding. Um, and it really was a symptom of how the trauma and, and all of the things that were uh, building up for her really impacted her sense of humor. Memory or disturbing intrusive imagery. Um, you may have thoughts about uh, a traumatic event someone has told you about. Uh, you know, we're all very good at visualizing as we're working with people and people uh, such as yourselves in helping services are usually pretty intuitive and pretty empathetic. And so disturbing influences or images or the memory of things that have happened that have been traumatic in the past. And finally, a sense of connection to others. One of the really um, potentially devastating impacts is individuals begin to isolate. Isolate from the, the clients, the peers that they work with, isolate from team members. Um, it's, I think uh, it's a common thing to isolate from supervisors because supervisors are often in a position of challenging us and um, you know, digging a bit deeply into how we're, we're working with peers or how we're dealing in our own lives. So we may find ourselves avoiding. And finally, isolating or avoiding loved ones, um, becoming really very um, reclusive and not being involved in any kind of social activity or, you know, just kind of um, withdrawing. So that can be one of the um, sort of experiences that we come to with vicarious trauma, which comes from working with others who have experienced trauma in their lives. Next slide. When all of those uh, secondary and vicarious trauma comes together, it can result in what we call compassion fatigue. That's a more severe example of the cumulative stress of working with those people um, whose needs are so extreme. And you know, many of the peers that you work with have, have lots and lots of needs. Probably one of the biggest issues that we're facing in our communities today um, is issues around housing, safe, sober, protective, uh, supportive housing. Um, becoming more and more of a challenge. But other needs, um, relationship needs, uh, safety needs, um, the needs for association with other people in recovery and developing a, a strong support network. So all of these needs, including the trauma that people have experienced or that they may currently be experiencing, because certainly not all trauma experience for the people we work with is safely tucked away in their past. Sometimes it's ongoing. Compassion fatigue includes a sense of exhaustion and dysfunction, simply not being able to, to be as functional, to be as effective um, as we know we should be able to be, as we, as we have been in the past. It includes physical and emotional uh, exhaustion. Um, it's, it's sort of related to something that we once called burnout, although burnout um, tends to 
be something that can happen rather quickly, uh, while compassion fatigue really has a, a slower onset. And so as a result, sometimes we don't realize, you know, it's like the old, uh, the old example of the frog in the, the pot of water that gets heated slowly until it's boiling, and the frog gradually becomes used to it and doesn't jump out. We can be like that frog, and the cumulative impact of dealing with the trauma that other people uh, represent in our lives in terms of the people that we work with. Next slide. So we talk about that as compassion fatigue. Some of the symptoms or results that we may find or we may recognize, of course, it's always easier to recognize things in other people. Um, you know, how many times have we heard someone say, I'm just asking for a friend, but what about this? Well, um, we're probably better able to see it in others than we are in ourselves, which is why it's so important to have a strong support system and to have good supervision and to be open and honest and, um, and to use your supervision effectively. Becoming excessively judgmental of others. Uh, tuning out, uh, and as you're working with peers, just finding it hard to really pay attention to what they're telling you and to really be present with them in the moment. Um, disconnecting from colleagues and, and from loved ones. Uh, becoming cynical, angry, or hopeless. Uh, as I said, it's easier to recognize these things in other people. And I'm sure as I talk about some of these things, you can recognize in your past or maybe maybe currently individuals who demonstrate some of these things, who are cynical, who are who are really angry, um, who are feeling hopeless about being able to be effective, about being able to impact uh, change in other people that they're working with. Uh, developing either overly rigid and strict boundaries or kind of going the other direction and kind of developing these rescue fantasies of uh, or over involvement of individuals with the people that you're working with. Um, good boundaries, you know, we talk about that a lot, but um, that's something that supervision should always be about. Um, having a trusted peer, um, co-worker that you can speak with. And I know some of you work in situations where you may be the only peer support person in that organization. And developing a, a support network with other peer support people is something that's really important. And conferences like this can help with, and I hope in agencies and community settings, we, we get better at developing that kind of peer support network of, of associates, because they can be a great sounding board to help us see ourselves like a mirror, to see ourselves in ways that we may miss otherwise. Next slide. What puts you at risk for compassion fatigue? And there are a number of factors, um, individual risk factors, factors related to my work situation, or factors specific to my community. So among the individual risk factors on the next slide, um, these are factors that are specific to you. Um, next slide. These factors have to do with your individual background. So your personality and coping style. Are you someone with a tendency to withdraw under stress? Or are you someone um, who may have some unhealthy coping styles. Um, current life circumstances, you know, we may be doing very well and then suddenly an elderly parent has a fall and has a fracture and requires additional care, maybe lives in the same community or maybe not in the same community. Um, issues with our children, children, uh, you know, can bring many life circumstances to us that represent stressors um, and, and other kinds of life circumstances. Um, and so there are many uh, individual risk factors. Uh, your spiritual connection and spiritual resources or the lack 
of spiritual connection and spiritual resources, however that plays out in your life. Work style, you know, for years we talked about uh, type A people who are very driving, um, type B people who are more, uh, you know, laid back. Uh, if you're in that type A and you are really, you know, if, if you begin to have rescue fantasies about the people you work with, many times you will find yourself working um, over, you know, over overtime, being more available than is appropriate. You can't be available 24 hours a day if you're the kind of work style that makes that feel like um, the way to function, then that's going to be an individual risk factor. If you can't disconnect, I often think a great, um, a great test is how long can you sit at a red light and not look at your phone for a text or an email? Um, and that's a real challenge because we've been told that you can't use your phone even during a red light. And I'm guessing that many of us probably break that law uh, and, and you know so our work style can get in the way of um, our risk management for compassion fatigue and then your personal history many many of us come to this work um, with our own experiences of uh, trauma of adverse childhood experiences which we'll talk about in a moment um, and so these individual factors they're kind of the, the baggage, in a sense, that we bring with us, the very part of our personal makeup, some of which is what draws us to this work in the first place. Next slide. So what other risk factors are there? So we talk about individual risk factors. There's the adverse childhood experiences. Um, we know that there are also resilience factors. And many of us certainly do have those, um, you know, do, do have those uh, positive experiences in our background. And I think we might need to back up one slide, Anna or, or uh, Alejandra, um, or maybe, okay, all right, let's, let's, let's go ahead. So individual risk factors moving ahead. Um, so let's talk a bit about the um, impact of elevated adverse childhood experiences. You can go to this great website called ACEs Too High, which after a while I figured out, oh yeah, that's kind of like ACEs High, only it's ACEs Too High. Um, so uh, adverse childhood experiences. Um, this is one of the slides that shows for men in the yellow bars and women in the red bars that individuals who have four or more adverse childhood experiences are uh, as much as 60% likely to experience lifetime chronic depression. Next slide. Childhood experiences underlie suicide attempts. Four or more ACEs shows a nearly 20% likelihood of an individual experiencing a suicide attempt. So these adverse childhood experiences stay with us, they come with us, they set us up in ways. And um, that becomes a part of your uh, risk factor and your personal risk factor that you bring to um, the experience of um, working with people, working with peers, uh, working in human services and in behavioral health. Next slide. So besides these individual factors that we come, the, the day we walk through the, the door for the first time at work, there are work situation factors themselves that add to this uh, sort of cumulative risk profile that we have. The first is our role at work. And naturally, um, you know, you are working by the nature of your work with individuals that come to you with risks, with trauma, with uh, great needs, with um, many, many challenges. And so you are by definition 
uh, uh, jumping into that sea of trauma every every day you walk through the front door. Don't quit doing it, but but recognize um, you know that that's part of what you're dealing with. Um, the setting and exposure certainly part of the fact that um, your organizations um, deal with people. Hold a welcome mat out for individuals um, in in need of behavioral health services and and coming often with trauma experiences working conditions um, many of you now probably are back to where you can do home visits uh, or community visits with people as opposed to office visits um, certainly i mean gosh when you think about the working conditions when we were trying to help people uh, during covid and the circumstances of our working conditions then. Um, agency and organizational understanding and support. I hope that you all are working in agencies who are very trauma-informed, who understand the factors that contribute to compassion fatigue in the workforce, uh, that are doing many proactive things. Um, unfortunately for most of us, our organizations are overwhelmed underfunded, under-resourced, trying to do the best they can to meet the many needs, the increasing needs of people in the community. And so sometimes um, it's easy to lose sight of and to um, deprioritize support for the individuals that are working in our organization. And finally, client responses and reactions. Some of you, I'm quite sure, are working with individuals that come to you because someone in authority, whether it was an employer, uh, uh, whether it was a family member, whether it was the court system, the judicial system, said, you've got to go to treatment. You've got to go to get services. And they may not be as, um, open to those services. They may not have an understanding of how a peer support specialist or recovery coach can be helpful to them. Um, they may not welcome the efforts that you make um, and they may not follow through always with the things that you are trying to accomplish with them. So your role, your work setting, your agency's understanding, and the, the very responses and reactions of the peers that you work with can create risk factors in your work situation. Next slide. And so if that weren't enough, and it certainly could be enough, um, there's also the community. The community itself represents some possible uh, risk factors cultural factors, uh, what the community attitudes for people with mental health issues or addictions, uh, the community attitude toward individuals. Maybe you work in a, in a criminal justice reentry program and how the community views people who have criminal backgrounds or histories. Um, other cultural factors, do uh, elements of the community have a basic uh, distrust of um, organized agencies, and especially if you work for uh, a government-supported organization. What the available resources are. Many of you work in rural areas where all of the things that we might expect uh, to be available to people, say, in, in Boise or uh, Coeur d'Alene or Pocatello or Idaho Falls, those things aren't always uh, readily available in many of our more rural areas. And so the available resources to be able to match your peers with as you try to help them navigate the um, human services system and attempt to um, solidify and, and support their own recovery, those aren't always there. And so that puts additional pressure on you to find the resources, to put together a a helpful plan to help your um, peers become connected to a recovery community. The community environment. Um, is it a community with uh, you know, uh, significant poverty? Is it a community with um, 
you know, unemployment? Is it a community that may have, you know, I think in, in most ways in Idaho, we've been spared a lot of the natural disasters that have happened in other parts of the country, um, but a community that has recently experienced you know, a devastating wildfire or a flood or a hurricane or a, a tornado. Um, knock on wood, we're, we're lucky to live in Idaho. Um, you know, those community environmental factors. Um, and then finally, a community history or a community experience of current trauma. And certainly um, a piece of that is a community-wide experience of something like a major school uh, shooting. Uh, you know, we have in, in our own state, in Moscow, four university students murdered, you know, in the past, the past week. Um, you know, it doesn't seem like you have to be very far from the news to find a current trauma experience that hits very close to home. And so those additional factors um, enter into putting together, you know, what is our what is our risk profile for trauma and the things that impact us as we, you know, it's like we keep adding and adding and adding to this backpack that we carry around with us that is our risk of uh, compassion fatigue. Well, having dwelt <laughs> on all of these risk factors, is there any good news? Absolutely, there is good news. Uh, next slide. First of all, um, there are resilience and protective factors. We may experience adverse childhood experiences, but we also have, you know, uh, in that backpack, so to speak, or, or helping to reduce the weight of that backpack, some other factors that are protective or resilience factors, parental love, the support of neighbors, relatives, you know, a friend's parents, um, teachers, coaches, youth leaders or ministers who actually liked and helped me and kind of reached out to me uh, and made me feel like I was worthwhile and I was important. A trusted person I could go to, someone that um, I knew I could talk about what was happening in my life without you know, judgment, someone who would help me um, and someone whose, value, whose values were, were such that I felt I could trust their, their advice or their counsel. Uh, consistent, understandable rules at home. Uh, important people in my life who cared about me, um, people who I th who thought I was capable or talented. Um, you know, certainly in my life, I can I can name people who, over the years, you know, were very complimentary, and often they would tell my parents something about what they thought that I was able to do, or you know, that I was smart or that I was talented. Um, and you know, my parents passed those those words on, and so I had a feeling that um, there were people who who believed in me. And um, so those things are protective factors that weigh into how we look at life and um, how we understand the trauma sort of profile that we come with. Next slide. So there are ways, um, you know, in addition to um, understanding that there are things that in our history, in our background, in our current life that um, helps us to manage and to uh, carry the trauma backpack, shall we say. Um, there's also a plus side to our work. You know, our work doesn't just bring us uh, trauma exposure. Um, we find purpose. We find meaning and satisfaction in helping others. Um, we may gain a sense of strength and confidence as we help others, that we, you know, that we can bring a, a force for healing, that we can demonstrate hope, that we can demonstrate walking a, a path of wellness and recovery. And as we do that, we gain a sense of our own strength and our ability to really be a help to other people. 
I believe that we gain a respect for human resilience when we see people that we work with, you know, move forward and and in, increase their confidence and uh, you know gain uh, achievements in life, whether it's going back to school and being successful or getting a job and and getting a promotion or you know uh, in in some cases it may be uh, being able to restore family ties we gain an understanding that people are resilient, that um, people move ahead in their lives despite challenges and despite difficulties, and that we gain a sense of purpose in being a part of that, um, a part of that journey side by side with other people. And we may experience a heightened sense of spiritual connection to something greater than ourselves. Um, that we do the work we do, but we we don't do it alone, whether it be through valued colleagues, good supervisors, or higher power, um, that there is a connection to something more than selfishness, shall we say. So the next slide, um, as we think about compassion fatigue and compassion satisfaction, there are some ways of assessing your risk and your strengths. Um, one of those is to go online. You can go online and um, like, like you can Google almost anything, you can Google adverse childhood experience or ACE, ACEs questionnaire. And you will find online a way of uh, evaluating your background, your history in terms of adverse childhood experiences. There's something called the Holmes Ray Life Stress Inventory. And, you know, we talked about in, in addition to individual uh, circumstances that, that increase our risk of secondary trauma or of compassion fatigue, um, there are things going on in our life, life circumstances. And the Holmes Ray Life Stress Inventory, which you can also find online, um, will help you assess, you know, what's been going on in my life. You know, day to day, we we do what's in front of us. We, you know, solve certain problems. We move on. We uh, have challenges. We we deal with them. Um, and sometimes we don't recognize the accumulation of those things. The Holmes Ray Life Stress Inventory helps you to recognize that things that happen in your life, changes, um, in your relationships, in your work, in your living situation um, can add stress. And finally, something very important called the Professional Quality of Life Scale or the ProQual, P-R-O, capital Q, capital O, capital L. And that is something that's available to you in the uh, attachment as one of the handouts. And what it does is that it is an assessment uh, I'm really proud to say it's a very widely used national and international assessment, but it was developed here in uh, Idaho by an Idaho professor at Idaho State University, uh, Beth Stam. And um, so it tells you, it gives you questions to answer, and then it gives you some, some scores to assess your um, level of compassion fatigue, uh, your compassion satisfaction, uh, as well as, as some of your trauma um, scoring. So it is something that you can use. Um, it may be something that you might share um, with a supervisor. I think it's really important to make um, your um, capability at managing your stress and your, you know, your the stress level, the level of compassion, fatigue, and satisfaction in your life as a, an ongoing topic of discussion with your supervisor. And it may be that you are the one that needs to introduce that. Supervisors may be uh, unaware or reluctant um, to, to bring it up and, um, it may be something that you need to introduce. And the um, the ProQual and, and how you've done it or what you've learned from doing it or from any of these other uh, assessment tools may be something that you can bring 
to that process and open the lines of discussion. So as we said in the beginning, um, let's look at some risk reduction things that you can do. Um, and I think the first is that, as we said, it's a professional issue. It is a, an ethical issue and certainly a personal well-being issue. Um, the first is to take charge, accept the responsibility, um, just as you accept responsibility for seeking and finding continuing education to maintain your certification, accept the responsibility for doing those things that will enable you to continue to be a positive, effective peer support person. Uh, first of all, and, and I wish I could say you could go to any uh, Walmart or Walgreens and find this supplement. And if you take that supplement twice a day, all of this will be taken care of. Unfortunately, just like a lot of other good health habits, uh, there's work to be done. And one of the first issues is sleep. Um, identifying your sleep, your sleep patterns. Are you getting enough sleep? Um, you know, one of the one of the issues I often talk about, you know, uh, it's important to get up early enough to face the day in an organized way, rather than this mad dash that I'm sure all of us have been guilty of on more than one occasion, hopefully not every occasion. Um, but the way to do that is to get to bed early enough. And, you know, there seems like there are many factors that see the hands of the clock ticking beyond the time that you know you should be in bed, you should be relaxed, you should be ready to go to sleep. But uh, effective sleep, uh, assessing your sleep, uh, understanding if there are sleep issues, how you might be able to address those, um, looking for professional help if that's necessary. Sleep is just really critical. Healthy eating, we all know what that looks like. Um, I just had a quote wellness uh, checkup with my primary care physician. She said, how's your eating? I had to say, eh, well, you know, it could be better. Um, we all know what that healthy eating looks like. And uh, we, need to, we need to develop a plan just like we would with our peers. Okay, what's one more vegetable I could eat every day? You know, it doesn't have to be, all or nothing. I, you know, sometimes we tend to be a, a little bit on the all or nothing side. But you know, what kind of tweak could I do? Uh, could I drink more water? Um, you know, what things could I do that would fall in that nutrition area? Exercise. Exercise is really important. I am very fortunate in that I have a husband who really dogs me about getting out and walking with him. It's really hard right now because it is cold outside. And um, I'm great at uh, you know being willing to go along in uh, August and September, especially September, October, beautiful sunshine, beautiful color, nice warm weather. When it is in the 20s, it takes a little more uh, focus. It takes a little more push to get me out the door. And finally, uh, time out, you know, uh, Disconnecting from devices, uh, not checking your email uh, throughout the evening, um, taking time out, and not only on a daily basis, but um, vacations, long weekends. And I have to say, a long weekend is not a vacation. A vacation is at least seven days, and um, ideally even, even more than seven days. Uh, time to unwind, time to disconnect, time to replenish, to restore, um, so time out. Next slide. So, you know, those are the basics. There's nothing there that you've never heard before. I am quite sure, because I can certainly uh, attest in my own life, that there's at least one of those things you could do better, and maybe several of those things you could do better. Um, general approaches, basic healthy living practices, what we've just uh, really covered. Um, connecting with others, uh, friends, coworkers, texting, emailing, social event out. I have a, have, 
a group of friends um, that really do socialize. And I know that um, because I see their, their social events on Facebook. Uh, it would be good to uh, be on, uh, have some of your own social events uh, worthy of Facebook. You don't have to post everything you do, but uh, you know, being connected to others. Again, using your supervision effectively. Developing creative and enjoyable leisure activities. And I've bolded one of these, engaging in deeply engaging hobbies. Something that really takes you away from and really uh, immerses you in something different than the work that you do. This has been found through research to be one of the strongest benefits, one of the strongest ways of dealing with this kind of stress. Um, writing, letters, poems, thank you notes, journaling. Um, uh, my organization, Recovery Idaho, has a um, twice a month called Writing for Recovery with writing teachers teaching us a lot of different ways to write about things in our lives. And, you know, writing has been found to be a very effective healing and uh, risk management technique. Using your spiritual resources, whatever those are, uh, being connected to your religious community or other people who are like-minded, who, who spend some time thinking and talking about and reading uh, in spiritual resources. Learning something new, you know, going online. You can learn how to do all, well, anything uh, through a YouTube video. Um, you could learn a foreign language. Uh, you can, you, you know, sign up for a new word of the day. Um, learning something new, exercising parts of your brain that are sitting there just waiting, saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. Um, learning and actually doing uh, a mindfulness practice, whether that be a breathing mindfulness, um, you know, walking mindfulness, uh, whatever kind of mindfulness practice, and there are uh, some great apps for that that we're going to speak about in our next slide. Uh, but actually doing it, you know, setting time aside and learning to um, to do something mindful that is interrupts the cycle of of concern and rumination and um, sort of stress that's going on, this, this kind of uh, stress talk in our life and in our, in our self-talk. So there's an app called Mindfulness Coach. And, and if you Google these, or if you go to the app store, uh, PTSD Coach, PTSD Family Coach. There's an app called Calm, and I believe it has both a free and a paid for version. Um, there's one that's really fabulous called Daily Habit, and finally one called Virtual Hope Box. Um, and um, we'll leave those up for just a minute so you can so you can take a note and write them down. But um, there's and, and then if you just Google, you know, uh, stress management apps or stress uh, reduction apps or mindfulness apps. Uh, Dr. Google will tell you some things that you can do, things that you can use. So in the next slide, there are also some kind of quick fixes um, that you can use. Um, stare at something pretty or personally meaningful. Maybe there's a photograph of a favorite place. Maybe it's a picture of your, your kids. Maybe it's a picture of your pet. And in some ways, I'm thinking maybe a picture of your pet is less stressful than a picture of your kids. Um, sing or otherwise make music. Um, a friend did a great talk at church, actually, one day about the benefits of singing in the choir. He did happen to be the choir director at the time, but he convinced me and I joined the choir. And I, I tell you, I have loved it. And um, you know, singing in a choir, um, making music. If you're lucky enough to have been bullied by a parent into learning the piano, I wish I had been. Um, but uh, other other ways of 
uh, making music or certainly listening to music, preferably upbeat or classical music. Um, we talked about connecting with others, text a friend, hug someone. Now that COVID is over, we can hug again. Oh my gosh, thank goodness. Um, and if you know me, if you see me, uh, come find me, I, I, I'm into hugging. Take a walk or other quick physical activity and stairs are really good. Um, you know, climbing stairs. I have a friend who lives in a community um, with a lighthouse and the lighthouse is reached by climbing 387 stairs and she does it every day. I did it once, she does it every day uh, and does it at such time to greet the sunrise. Um, stairs are great, taking a walk, a quick walk. Um, walk around the block, it doesn't have to be 387 stairs. Uh, play with a pet, pet a pet. Um, I love to go for walks because they're usually people walking their dogs. And I don't have a dog, so I get to play with their dog for a, for a moment. Uh, breathe, really breathe. Learn to breathe from your diaphragm. Um, get some little, really little thing done. Maybe it's cleaning out one drawer. Maybe it is cleaning out your purse. Uh, how about the jockey box in your car? Um, send a thank you note or an email. Um, there are many people in our daily lives that do things that we, you know, we're grateful for in the in the moment, in the second, and then we move on. Send a thank you note. Maybe it's something that someone did a long time ago. Um, give a sincere compliment. And finally, um, write in a gratitude journal. Um, we had in a group I belong to an exercise with Thanksgiving coming up to come up with 100 things you're grateful for. And you know, that seems like a lot. And um, it's not as hard to do as you might think. And as we meditate, as we reflect on the things that we're grateful for, the things that are troubling us, the things that um, we wish we had, as opposed to the things that we do have, um, the things that we do have become much more uh, prevalent in our mind. So uh, in final thoughts, um, get a direct personal support, a friend, supervisor, someone you can uh, reach out to, both to receive support and to give support. Find a buddy, share your goals, uh, be in touch with other people, uh, support and hold each other accountable. When you see a coworker and you know they're putting in more hours than is healthy, than they're supposed to be. When you see their boundaries begin to get a little shaky, um, hold them accountable um, with care and concern, not criticism, but hold them accountable and, and support each other. Celebrate successes, even small ones. Did you go out and, and walk around the block? Great, celebrate. Uh, did you eat um, broccoli one night for dinner? Uh, celebrate. Um, analyze and learn from setbacks. And use the five-minute strategy. So the five-minute strategy says, well, I may not be able to um, do this for an hour, but I can, I can do it for five minutes. Um, you know, build that sort of thing in. And finally, in the next slide, um, make a commitment to, um, to get started. Um, identify your barriers. What's getting in the way of your making a change? Uh, what could you do to overcome that barrier? What is a very small step you could take tomorrow or Monday? I always like to start things on Mondays, but uh, tomorrow would be a fine day to start being healthier, being uh, more in control of your stress. So we'll switch now to the last slide, which are some resources uh, that you might want to make note of, and we'll see if there's any questions. So Alejandra, do we have any questions from the group? Um, thank you, Norma, for an awesome presentation. I don't have any questions in the questions box yet, but um, some messages of gratitude. Love these, even to help my peers. Thank you, I love these. 
and I really needed this as I'm very much feeling compassion fatigue. Thank you. Well, very good. There, there are so many forces pulling us in the direction away from you know, we talk about self-care, self-care, self-care. The problem with talking about self-care is it sounds selfish. It sounds like, you know, paying too much attention to ourselves and not to other people, which is what we're, you know, employed to do and what we're wanting to do and what we've trained to do and what we, you know, are drawn to do. Um, but recognizing, you know, going back to that idea that, uh, you know, it's like it's like they say on the airplane, uh, if the oxygen mask drops down, you put it on your face first, and then you help someone next to you. You cannot be an effective uh, peer support person. You cannot be an effective helping person. Um, you cannot help anyone else if you are experiencing compassion fatigue. And for those of us who are more motivated by doing things out of, uh, you know, a professional obligation or a, um, you know, ethical responsibility, that's that's exactly what this is. And for those of you that may be listening that are supervisors, um, you you really need to focus always with the people that you are supervising. What are you doing to manage your risk of secondary trauma? What are you doing to allay the onset of compassion fatigue? It's, it, it, I think it's so much important to say that in those terms rather than what are you doing for self-care? Because self-care kind of sounds like a bubble bath now and then. And, and it's definitely harder work, although there's nothing wrong with a bubble bath now and then. Mm -hmm. We had a question come in. How do we handle it if we are getting fatigue from the company we work for? Well, um, I think I think the first step there is to talk with your supervisor. I'm going to hope that you have a supervisor um, that is aware, that is trained, um, and you know do some analysis of what is it what is it that is uh, leading you in this direction is your caseload too large um, are the people that you're dealing with you know it, it's fine to have a caseload of x but if that caseload of x is all people in the earliest stage of treatment or recovery with none of their needs having been dealt with. I mean, you can only handle so many individuals um, in the very earliest stage. So is it your caseload? Um, is it other expectations about, you know, do you need help or training in some way? Uh, does the organization need to find and help um, streamline or train better in the area of paperwork? We all love paperwork. But that's, you know, I think that's something that can weigh us down and be a major, um, a major issue. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I, I hate to say at some point there may come a time when you recognize that your situation and your organizational setting is untenable. And uh, that's when you need a support system outside of your organization to process with, to talk about, uh, to look for alternatives. When we, when we get under too much stress, sometimes we can't see the way out. We can't see the, the forest for the trees. And having a support system that can help us to identify what can we do, what do we need to do, um, you know, what, what possible solutions are there. And if it is an untenable situation, how do we extricate ourselves in a in a professional but in a healthy manner? Thanks, Norma. All right, I just want to remind everybody about the final training that we have today at 2:45 here in 15 minutes. I know it's been a really long day, but 
This training is on stages of change, and the presenter, Jeannie, is going to be covering the trans-theoretical model. So I highly recommend you join us if you're able to. Um, I will put the registration link in the chat right now, right now, right now, in like two seconds. And other than that, I think we're good to go. Again, Norma, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to learn from you as always. And, and I'm really grateful that everybody is joining us today. Um, again, I know it's a really long day, but um, there's lots of really great information. I just sent the registration link for that Stages of Change um, presentation in the chat. All right. Thank you, Alejandra. It's been a pleasure. Um, I love this material. I love this workforce. Um, I wish everybody a wonderful holiday season coming up. It's a great time for self-care and, and wellness. And um, so everybody have a great holiday. Sounds good. And I'm seeing some comments of their folks are able to access that link. Um, if you go to the Empower Idaho website, the link will be there as well under the peer support conference. Um, sorry that it's a little bit last minute that I can't send it to everybody individually, but if you go to the website, you'll be able to register there. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Goodbye now. Bye.